Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. It is true. Uh, ChatGPT does not know who I am. Um, but yes. So uh, thank you, KDD, for the award and recognition. Um, I wanted to uh, present this. I uh, came out from my role in the trenches. Um, I was the eighth author of 16 on this paper, um, representing our, our ads click-through modeling group. Um, most of those folks are still at Google. About half of them still work in ads. All of them still work in ML optimization, data science. Um, I have grown from junior member to running the ads click group. Um, so it fell to me to have to show up and talk. <laughs> OK. So uh, it's interesting to think about the context of when we wrote this paper in 2013. Um, there's very little in terms of like novel technical content in the paper. It is mostly a survey, a series of sub-problems and sort of state-of-the-art solutions in, in large-scale click prediction. Um, it's very much, you know, just covers a lot of focus areas. Uh, you know, in the, in the abstract, it's the selection of case studies and topics, which is very much true. And, you know, as I go through this talk, I am mostly going to cover a lot of the same topics and uh, how they've evolved through the years. Um, most of it not published by our group. Our group doesn't pop up to publish too much. Um, you know, but... Uh, this is a problem of very great impact. Ad click prediction is uh, you know, one of Google's largest and toughest core problems. It's a tough core problem for a lot of other big tech companies. Um, and uh, you know, it, uh, scalable optimization of this form brings up a lot of hairy focus areas. So, um, in the paper, we, you know, we said the goal of the paper is to give a reader a sense of the depth of challenges in real industrial settings. I think in 2013, we felt uh, there was a dearth of papers in the field that really got into what was actually hard about doing this at scale. Uh, at that point, there was still quite a bit of gap in scale between what was happening in the academic community and the industry. That gap has closed a lot in the last 10 years. Um, and we still see a good amount of these kind of industry scale papers. Um, we hope we had an influence on, on the generation of such papers. Um, you know, and then the other hope in a paper like this is that you've helped to steer the field toward problem of interest. Um, so this paper garnered, you know, it's got about 1,100 citations. Like the vast majority of those are the, in the introductions of papers where people say, hey, we're working on this problem which is important in industry citation, right? And you know what, in, in many cases, that kind of direction is, is working as intended. Not in terms of buffing citation counts, because you know we don't care about those. We're not academics. But in terms of influencing the field and letting people know what kinds of problems are important. A couple of similar works uh, around the same time. Uh, the next year after, in 2014, uh, there was a, a large survey paper came out of Facebook. Um, it's a very, very similar work. It's very related. Um, the two of those together. Uh, summarize a lot of the state of the art for very large scale, you know, sparse linear models. Um, there was a lot of overlap in terms of technology that showed up, um, you know, and so that was a nice one. A few years later, we did publish again. Uh, the Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems um, was another pub paper published by our group. Um, it had even less depth and more breadth and talked really about what it means to put together a large-scale production ML uh, installation. Um, and it had sort of that same core idea of exposing the challenges for, that are real in industry. Um, that paper was hugely influential, probably more so than this one even, um, really sort of spurring on the field of ML operations and ML software and um, all sort of the supporting code that goes into very large-scale uh, machine learning. Um, and then last year, I'll put it in a shameless plug for our group popped up one more time. Um, we uh, published a paper. Uh, it was in an awesome workshop last year. Uh, and that uh, is an update on what we're doing these days um, in terms of a lot more modern techniques for industrial scale ML engineering. What do things like neural architecture search and distillation look like at scale? Um, so. Uh, with that, I will start serving some of the uh, 
main tasks, right? So the main setup of the paper um, is to predict the probability of a user clicking on an ad given a query and an ad. And this is sort of a very, you know, basic clean formulation that has stood the test of time. It's a problem that we've worked on for 10 years, and there's many, many papers published in this area. Um, you know, we presented online training. Not a lot of stuff in industry was working online at the time in terms of streaming data um, and learning as we go. Uh, that's really, it's a critical feature of a lot of industrial systems that is, you know, still not as represented in the literature as it should be. Um, let's see, yeah. Uh, it's a very data de dependent, non-stationary problem. Uh, and it's extremely sparse. Um, so you have this very, very huge data set of query document pairs, query ad pairs, um, with a very, very long tail. And uh, a lot of this paper was uh, scaling up the size of that data set. Uh, when I look back at this paper, a lot of it is about memory management for large models, um, because we were starting to work on data set sizes in the hundreds of billions, um, and models in the tens of billions, um, which was you know, a few orders of magnitude larger than what else was going on at the time. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not mention focusing on the long term, which is a related paper that also came out around that time. Um, you know, we, this paper was about predicting ad clicks and ad click prediction, and those are a very important component to auctions and to long term value and to, you know, user value and things. Around the same time, Google published uh, a very important paper about uh, measuring long-term versus short-term impact of optimization changes in recommenders. Um, and uh, this paper is near and dear to my heart about sort of uh, separating the, the test criteria that we use for evaluating our ranking and recommender systems uh, from the ML objectives of simply predicting clicks. We did not talk a lot about architecture in the paper. We chose to skip over a lot of that. Um, around the year before, the Vorpal Rabbit paper came out of uh, Yahoo Research. Um, that was uh, you know, pretty influential on the field, and they released all the open source code. Um, our platform was a little bit similar to that um, at a slightly larger scale. Um, We'd spent some time with Alex Smola, came and visited our group for a few months, uh, and then he wrote the Scaling Distributed Machine Learning with the Parameter Server paper. Parameter Server architecture and that API that was built uh, pretty much captured state-of-the-art for large-scale linear models um, you know, that could scale up pretty much without bound uh, in terms of sparsity. Uh, and that was by enabling distributed training both along model and data distribution. So sharding up models um, and, and sharding up data to scale up roughly as big as you want it to go. And so that's kind of where that architecture was. And it kind of terminated about there for large linear models until we got into the world of, of deep neural nets. Um, Uh, there's a significant portion of this paper was dedicated to optimizers. Um, in this paper, we talked a lot about follow the regularized leader, FTRL, which was an optimization algorithm that perhaps didn't stand the test of time. But, uh, you know, we, optimizers have gotten a lot farther. Um, some of the newer stuff on second order optimization still, you know, still trying to get its legs in the field. Um, but, you know, we've uh, gone to moving towards that. And so the shampoo and the line optimizer are both what we use in Google Ads now. Um, symbolic discovery for optimization algorithms is extremely new. Um, this is sort of like auto-generation of code through evolutionary algorithms with some human supervision to sort of clean them up. Um, it's interesting that optimization uh, research still continues. Um, you know, there's, it's a very important area. Um, quantization. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about quantization in that paper because we were working at a very large memory scale. Um, I think that has only grown in importance as we've gotten to custom hardware and more compute. I think a lot, at that time, quantization, a lot of it was about saving RAM and memory because we were scaling up data sizes. Linear models, pretty cheap on compute. 
Um, with the advent of neural networks, we're obviously spending a lot more compute, and quantization for good compute also matters. Um, uh, you know, to some degree, uh, you know, as we have scaled up compute, we have coevolution of hardware algorithms and performance all at the same time. Um, so Google's obviously built very large TPU platforms. Um, we've worked hand in hand with those groups um, to be able to support these kind of uh, super large ad click prediction models. Um, you know, very much you still need hardware support for large embeddings and memory bandwidth and scaling up memory. Um, that's something that you see a lot in all of the uh, different custom hardware software setups that come out of other folks. Um, sparsity is still around, uh, you know, mixtures of experts and pathways, and we're still trying to capture sparsity in the right ways. I think DNNs, um, you know, really were a slap in the face to sparse methods, but things are coming back around again um, as we try to find efficiency in new ways. Um, you know, as we've scaled up compute with DNNs, uh, ML performance for training is increasingly important. Um, I would say in 2013, there was very little thought to uh, ML training performance. Everything was about inference and, perform and you know, quality of models. Um, model training efficiency in terms of, you know, you're trying to run an iterative industry where we're gonna do a lot of research. Uh, that's an incredibly important topic. Uh, in this paper, we spoke a lot about feature inclusion and hashing. So in the paper, when you're working with really large, sparse features and you're trying to figure out what to include in a linear model, um, there was a lot of uh, bloom filter-based count methods. Um, we see those still popping up in industry. So the monolith paper out of ByteDance last fall, um, in terms of their very large embedding models, um, uses almost exactly the same types of bloom filter methods. Um, you know, in terms of aggressive feature hashing and the hashing trick, you know, we saw pretty negative results on that. Um, I'd say in the modern world, there's mixed results on feature hashing for very large scale data. Um, we definitely see negative results coming out of folks like Facebook and Baidu in terms of their systems, moving to other collisionless compression methods, um, finding the limits of hashing as we've scaled up data to be so large. Uh, feature interactions is something that was conveniently sort of left out of the original paper. Um, we talked about billions and trillions of features, um, but not in terms of feature crosses and, and feature search and things like that. Um, it was left out a bit by design because there's you know, a fair amount of technology there. Um, you know, you've seen there's actually tons and tons of papers that uh, cite this trenches paper. Uh, and this shortcoming of it. So roughly, you know, many, many papers that come up with new feature interaction methods, you know, advertise their own superiority to uh, this, you know, linear sparse models that don't handle feature interactions. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, there was definitely feature interaction layers involved in this model in 2013. Uh, we just really weren't writing about them yet. And then I think the last sort of survey area was in automated feature management. Um, this was a, a bit of a small thing to talk about then um, in terms of when you're running a real large installation, you know, you're looking at lots and lots of feature data and lineage, and all of this is really difficult. And so we started building these kind of systems for managing features and inputs and categorical features and dependencies between things. That has grown to manage, you know, lineage between data sets, distillation, pre-trained components, you know, pre-computed embeddings. All of this stuff is increasingly important uh, to current and future regulatory stuff, to ML safety, um, understanding where and how our data gets to our model, what's the provenance of a model, what would it take to rebuild this model, what does it actually depend on? Um, you know, this is a, a very important topic. Um, and I think not a lot was being said about that in 2013. Um, 
So that's kind of summarizing you know, the areas of the paper and where I think they've gone. Um, how can I summarize the influence of the paper? Um, so I put on my 2013 hat um, to try to summarize influence. And I went through and scraped all of the titles of all of the papers that cited this one. And in true 2013 style, I put them together in a word cloud. <laughs> Um, which tells you what word clouds do, which is that you have a lot of words and some of them are bigger. Um, uh, when I change from my 2013 hat to my 2023 hat and say, how do I summarize the impact of a paper? Well, I just go ask Bard um, and get you know, the wall of text with some bulleted lists that one would expect to come out of an LLM. Um, there's a few factual errors in there, but we won't worry too much about them. Uh, if we take the LLM response and then summarize it with a human, you get bullets, you know, this was used by practitioners. It's comprehensive overview, number of solutions, clear style, raises awareness, developments in new techniques. Um, and the summary sentence from the LLM is that it had a positive impact on the field of ad click prediction, and it's likely to continue to be influential for years to come. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how likely it is to continue to be inf influential. You know, uh, what about this still matters in the era of DNLs and LOMs? Um, well, a lot of this paper and a lot of the methods in there were about scaling up data size. Uh, back then with linear sparse models, you compute's very cheap and you're scaling up data. DNNs, I think, in the last 10 years became the way to scale up compute um, you know, relative to data. And so now we're both scaling up and costs are going out through the roof. Uh, so efficiency comes into play uh, even more so than it did back then. Um, LLMs are not gonna solve everything. I think we still have a lot of real world optimization problems that need regression, they need probability, they need calibration uh, in ways that language models are not adept at providing. Um, you know, data dependent solutions uh, to data problems. Um, some of the most durable things I find in this paper are things about problem framing and evaluation. Uh, there's a section on visualization. Um, we created a tool back then called the GridViz Visualization Tool. It's very much still in use. Uh, you know, it's described in the paper. It gives a holistic view of high dimensional accuracy metrics. Um, it's very, very powerful. Um, you know, it's a black box evaluation method for models. So it's you know, very, very durable to build things like that. Um, online training and progressive validation uh, is still just such a huge difference um, between what's important in industry and what shows up uh, in so much literature. Um, this was a paper that was in SIG IR just this year that I saw. Um, just kind of yet another paper bemoaning the lack of online evaluation for recommenders um, because it's uh, traditional evaluation techniques can leave so much out. Um, Okay, and with one last slide, um, I would say my summary on this paper and thinking back over the 10 years is that uh, it was really an example of trying to do good science in industry. Um, this is really, really an impactful problem. And so iterative progress on this um, has to be very, very rigorous. It has to be modular. Modular in the sense of working on every possible sub-problem. Um, you know, being able to reproduce the minor improvements, discussing the negative results. I think discussing the negative results in here was a big deal for us in 2013. Um, you know, the reproducibility crises in machine learning over the last five years um, have not been great. And uh, when we're working on problems of this scale and impact, we have to understand exactly where, why, and how we drive overall improvements because that's how we turn this sort of art of model improvement into a science and into something we can engineer, um, is to truly and deeply understand where the gains come from so that we can find more. Um, so that's it. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you to all my co-authors.